All right, everyone, uh, welcome. I want to welcome you here. My name is Clyde Cleveland. I'll be your speaker for the next hour, and thank you very, very much for coming. I know that you had lots of other good options, so I'll try to do justice for you coming to see me. Uh, this material is pretty powerful. I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, just a little bit about me. Uh, I've been a businessman most of my life. Uh, before I was a businessman, I was a teacher of Transcendental Meditation. Actually ran the TM Center here in San Diego for a few years before I went into real estate, realized I couldn't support my family uh, teaching meditation, and uh, got into real estate. Caught a great wave in 77 in this town. Incredible wave. It was just like catching the perfect wave. You know, we went from food stamps to a house in La Jolla in two years, nice. from 77 to 79. So, um, my career has been up and down. I've had some great successes. We've also had some, due to many changes in tax laws, things like that, uh, lost some businesses along the way and then started others. I'm actually a walking, living, breathing testament to having bankruptcy laws because I've had to go bankrupt twice, but both times I went bankrupt within a year or two. I had companies with at least 40 employees. Nice. So created hundreds, thousands of jobs in my career um, and learned a lot. My dad was a railroad detective, so I knew nothing about business. I didn't grow up in a business family. And uh, so I just had to teach myself. But uh, so I've had a successful career in business because of my run-ins with the IRS, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Department of Human Services, and other agencies of the government. I felt the boot of government on my neck throughout my life at different times, and that makes you radical. Yeah. And that's why I got into politics. I've run for office twice, ran for governor of uh, Iowa as a libertarian in uh, 2002, and uh, been active in the tax reform area. Um, was able to spend a lot of time with G. Edward Griffin, speaking with him on different tours, got to know him. He had a big impact on me. And uh, more recently, uh, Michael Badnerick here and I created an organization called Free America Now, which helped Sheriff Mack create the first ever sh uh, Constitutional Sheriff Convention in Las Vegas a couple of years. So I've done a lot of different things. I've written a couple of books, Restoring the Heart of America in 2002, which was endorsed by Ron Paul and Gary Johnson, and then more recently, uh, Common Sense Revisited, which Ron Paul put on his Campaign for Liberty site right when it opened, and it was on there for about six months, and we sold probably 60 or 70,000 copies of this, which was fantastic. And uh, I have these downstairs. I'm actually, my wife wants them out of the basement, what I have left. <laughs> and so I'm actually giving these away. All she said is, just make, have them pay for shipping, and we'll basically send you as many copies of this excellent pamphlet for, it's a, like a beginner, it's like a primer for people who don't know what's going on, who need to have an idea and read it in two hours. And I also have a CD um, of the book. So it's fun. People like it. They can put it in their car and listen to it. Um, so how do, how do we phase out of this coercive situation? I'm assuming that everybody in this audience is here because you understand that our system is broken. And we want to do something different that is not as coercive and oppressive and as destructive of our liberties and our freedom. Right? Is everybody with me on that? So, I love this quote. It's a quote from Buckminster Fuller. It says, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's what we're going to do, all of us together. We're going to create a new model that is so much more enjoyable, prosperous, allowing for prosperity, freedom, liberty, success in life, and every other phase of life better than the existing model so that people will leave the existing model and come to the new model. That's exactly what we're going to do. And my feeling is, is that the best way to do that is show examples of how this model already exists in certain organizations and has done extremely well. And that's the thrust of my talk today. Okay. Um, that to understand and appreciate this, you have to understand a little bit about power and the nature of power. Because that's what our existing system is all about, is power. The, accumulation, the maintenance and accumulation and increasing of power. I like to talk about, and I talk in my books, about indigenous power and surrogate power as a way of understanding power today. 
Indigenous power is a power that we have, that we're born with as human beings. It's the power to create. We're the only entities on planet that have the ability to have a thought and manifest that thought into reality, whether it's building a building or McDonald's or a baseball diamond in our community. We have the ability to think a thought and bring the resources together to have, make that thought a reality. That's our indigenous power, and only human beings have that power. But what we do is we find as human beings that sometimes we want to create some institution to make our life easier for us or make life safer or more successful. And we create institutions, and they're corporations, businesses, limited partnerships, governments, uh, religions, and unions, and all nonprofit organizations. These are all institutions that we create. Now, I call these institutions surrogates because they're surrogates for us, but they do not have indigenous power. They can't have because they aren't human beings. The notion that the Supreme Court can say a corporation has the same rights as an individual is absurd. They don't. They just don't. Nature didn't create them that way. It's a corporation. It's an entity that we created that has surrogate power that we give it. And what we do is we give them a corporate charter, a limited partnership agreement, a constitution, a written agreement that they're supposed to follow. And that can work out OK as long as they follow it and you stay on top of them. Because, because the natural tendency of people to want to increase their power, that doesn't always happen, does it? And these surrogates become corrupt they begin to think that they have indigenous power and they will use whatever means, fraud, trick, trickery, deceit, coercion, to make you think that they have indigenous power. Divine Right of Kings is a beautiful example of that. It's a beautiful example of the Catholic Church and the nobility of Europe getting together, creating this imaginary concept of Divine Right of Kings and enforcing it on the people. It's a surrogate, two surrogates, completely out of control, working together to enslave us. And that's what these surrogates do. That's what we have today. We have corporations, banks, unions, governments, all these top-down institutions, surrogates, working together to enslave us. That's what we have. And it's really all about the nature of power. These are my four favorite quotes of power. Power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. We've always all heard that, right? But the rest of that quote is, great men are almost always bad men. Now here's the deal. Unlimited power, this is William Pitt, unlimited power is apt to corrupt the minds of those who possess it. So even if you're a good guy when you go into one of these institutions, the taste of power is like a drug, a very addictive drug. And even the best meaning people are corrupted by it. And Jefferson knew that. He talked about this. He said, even. All of you, you officials, you congressmen, this is one of his speeches, including me, just because of our nature, we tend to be corrupted by this power. And then, uh, this is one of my favorites, Frank Herbert. Power attracts the corruptible, and absolute power attracts the absolutely corruptible. And along the same lines, it is said that power corrupts, but actually it's more true that power attracts the corruptible. The sane, like us, are usually attracted by other things than power. Have you seen these, these work up these papers that people have written, people with a psychology background that, that talk about how our leaders, most of them are psychopaths, or at least sociopaths? I believe that, that that is true. And they may become that way, or have that tendency. But that's what power does. And hierarchy, uh, hierarchy supports that. That model of top down, this guy's in charge of this guy, this guy's in charge of this guy, it in, in reinforces that because people in power like that system because it helps them maintain their power. But it is absolutely the most unsuccessful, uh, inefficient, lacking in creativity model that we could, for human organization that we could possibly have. But everybody in this country just automatically thinks that's the way. That's the way we're trained. That's what we're used to. But guess what? It doesn't have to be that way. There are other organizational structures that work very, very well and are proven, and that's what we're going to talk about. By the way, the, the psychopath, I like to show this picture, because when I talk about psychopaths and so sociopaths, you know, how, who knows what that room is? Anybody? That's a room in Jekyll Island. That's Jekyll Island, Georgia, and that's a picture of me and Ed Griffin, who wrote The Creature from Jekyll Island. 
in the room where the Federal Reserve was created. When you get into that room, the whole concept that this is some theory goes away, okay? Because you're there and you're looking at this picture of the six men that were in that room in 1910. And that in the top, uh, top there, that's Nelson Aldrich at the top middle, uh, Benjamin Strong, Frank Vanderlip, and Paul Warburg. Everybody there represented one or two of the wealthiest families in the world. Most people feel that those six people represented somewhere around half or more of the wealth of the entire world in that room. And they spent two weeks there creating our Federal Reserve and the central bank. And the whole history of that is, is written there in the Jekyll Island Resort when you spend time there. It's quite an experience. One more quote about the end of the, what, what is the end of result of this system that we have? This is a quote by Tocqueville that I love, my favorite quote. Hence it is chiefly in war that nations desire and frequently need to increase the powers of the central government. All men of military genius are fond of centralization, which increases their strength. And all men of centralizing genius are fond of, fond of war, which compels nations to combine all their powers in the hands of the government. Why are we going into Syria today if we do? Because it increases the power of those who are there. There's no other reason. Everything else is baloney. All right, so let's look at some models. The first model I want to talk about is Gore and Associates. How many people have heard of Gore-Tex? The products, the Gore-Tex products, the boots, the jackets, the gloves. They were famous for those products back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, they, the company was founded by Bill Gore in 1958. Uh, the com company now has over 1,000 products, 10,000 employees in 50 locations around the world. Uh, in a recent year, they had 38,000 applicants. That's how many people wanted to work at Gore. They could only accept 260 of them, and, th and that was 6% growth. 40% uh, were are women. This is extraordinary. This is a company that is mostly engineers. It's a manufacturing and invention com company. And to have 40% women is, is an amazing. It says something about the nature of the company. Uh, annual revenues are $3 billion a year. They've never, in 50 years, they've never had a losing year. Uh, always first in employee satisfaction and retention. All associates, they don't have employees. Everybody's an owner. Everyone's called an associate. No titles, no bosses, and no formal hierarchy. They were named 100 best companies in Fortune magazine, 13th consecutive years, best workplaces in Europe, et cetera, et cetera, one of the most innovative companies in the world. This is from the comments from an interview of their head associate, what most, most companies would call a uh, CEO, this lady who runs the company today, uh, took over for <coughs> Bill Gore's son recently. These are some of her comments. We're a lattice or a network, not a hierarchy. Associates go directly to anyone in the organization to get what they need to be successful. Imagine that, being in an organization where you didn't have to go to your boss so he could take credit for whatever you wanted to do. You basically go to whoever you want to go that will listen to you and put together a team to succeed in whatever area that you have in mind. It's all about whether you can sell them on your idea. More powerful to have each person decide what they want to work on and where they can make the greatest contribution. Everyone decides what they're going to do in that company. Two sides to the coin. This is the two sides to the freedom coin. Freedom to decide and a commitment to deliver on your promises. If you don't deliver on your promises, if you don't work out and you consistently don't deliver, then you're going to be on your way out of core. And some people cannot handle the freedom. Most people love it. Pardon me? Well, nobody's going to, if, if, if you don't have somebody to work with and follow through on your ideas, you're not going to make any money at Gore. So in other words, you have to, at Gore, you have to enlist people, you have to sell people on whatever it is you want to work on, or you have to sell their team on you being part of their team. If they don't want you, there's nothing, you won't have any money, because everything, it, it's like, it's like a conglomeration of entrepreneurial companies within a big, big, bigger structure. That's what Gore is. Uh, to, so we allow the voice of the organization to determine who's really qualified to be a leader. There are leaders, but the leaders are determined by the willingness of others to follow that person. 
So all leaders are chosen naturally by their performance and the respect that they, they bring from others. And if that doesn't continue, they aren't leaders anymore. The guiding principles, fairness to each other and everyone with whom we come in contact, freedom to, this is from her also in terms of the principles, freedom to encourage, help, and allow other associates to grow in knowledge, skill, and scope of responsibility, ability to make one's own commitments and keep them, consultation with other associates before undertaking actions that could impact the reputation of the company. And these are, uh, these are Bill Gore's fundamental principles he started the company with. Freedom to innovate, believe in people, and what he means when he, when he says believe in people is believe that if you put somebody in a situation where they are free to develop their own ability and creativity and, and not inhibit that, in any way, that those people will be way more successful than any, anybody else that they're competing with. So that was his belief when he says believe in people. And, that, and lead, in, lead with values, that's the, his main value, or like his ethics. His ethics of the company is all about non-coercion and believing in people. Take the long view. This is not easy. It is not easy. This is another reason why we have hierarchy. It's real easy to say, okay, you be CEO, you pick your managers, and they'll pick their people. It's real easy to do that. It's not efficient. It's not creative. It doesn't develop the full potential of the individual by any means, but it's easy. This is not easy. It took them a long time, years, to develop their systems, the flat work network, the lattice kind of communications that they did. And then you have to be bold, but you have to stick. And what he means by that is you have to stick with those commitments. So that's a review of Gore. Incredibly, 10,000 people and no hierarchy. I met Bill Gore in 1986. He walked into my house to have lunch. His daughter, Susan, was on my board of directors of my company, United Investment Groups. We had a company that produced R&D, Research and Development Limited Partnerships. And our focus was on environmentally friendly companies. Susan really liked that. She met me. She invested in the company. It was a great meeting. She came in. I was trying to get $50,000 of her into my company, of hers into my company. And she said, well, I'll do it on one condition. And I said, what's that? She said, I want to be on your board of directors. And I thought, well, that's not a hard decision. <laughs> I said, well, I think I convinced convince the other directors that that would be a good idea. And, and she did. And so she was on my board. And she wanted her mom and dad to meet me when they were in town. This is in Fairfield, Iowa, where I live now. And so Bill Gore walks into my front door, and he hands me his card. And this is already the company was doing over a billion a year in revenue in 1986. He was a very wealthy man, very successful by that time. And I look at the card, and it says, Bill Gore, associate. Not chairman of the board, not wealthiest man in the world. He was one of the most humble kind, generous, loving people I've ever met. It was like I was, you know, with Buddha or something. I mean, he was an amazing man, and his wife, too. And Susan had grown up in that company. She was a small, she was like probably a young teenager when she started working in the company. So I had this incredible influence that I was too thick-headed to listen to, you know. And, and I, if I did make some changes in the company because of her, but not enough. And that's why in 1986, when the tax laws changed, I wasn't flexible enough. I had too many employees. I was too stuck in my ways. And I couldn't save my company when they changed the tax laws. But uh, anyway, that's, uh, I, I, I met that family, and they're incredible people. Great story. That company ha inspired a young man in Brazil by the name of Ricardo, Ricardo Semler. Has anybody heard of Semco, the book Maverick? Ricardo heard about Gore when he was like 19 or 20 years old. His father had started a manufacturing company in Brazil in the, in the 1950s. And it was having serious problems. And Ricardo kept banging on his dad to you know, get, go to the Gore model, a very similar model, give people more potential, give people more interest in the company, give people ownership, all these concepts. And his dad didn't listen to him, but finally, uh, when Ricardo was 22, the company was in such bad shape, his father resigned and gave the company to Ricardo. Uh, he, eliminated, he immediately eliminated all job titles. Everyone in the company knows what everyone else makes from that point on. Workers set their own hours. 
they receive profits, everyone receives the company's financial statements, and the labor union holds classes on how to read them. Workers choose their managers by vote and evaluate them regularly with the results posted publicly. Keep in mind, when he started this comp when he took over the company, it had already been in business for 22 years. They have very strong labor laws, very strong labor unions in Brazil. It wasn't like Gore, who started his company with these concepts from the very beginning. So it was really a challenge for him to implement these in a company that was already hierarchical. But he did a phenomenal job. It took him a while. It actually took him 20 or 30 years. But um, at one point, uh, in another, a few years after he took over, they had another emergency situation. And at that point, they set up uh, from an idea from one of the workers, they set up teams of six to eight production workers who would be entirely in charge of all aspects of production. They set their own budgets and production goals. Compensation was then tied to budget and produc pro production performance. Costs went down, produc productivity and profits went up, and the workers received about a quarter of the net profits from, those, from whatever unit they were in. So that took them more towards the model of having small units, like Gore did, small <coughs> units working together from that point on. Oh, and an elected committee of workers designed the program and allocates all the profit-sharing funds. Then, about 10 years later, they had another crisis because of economic conditions in their industry, whatever, and they almost lost the company. In fact, they were going to lay off a, a significant portion of the workers. The problem is in Brazil, you have to pay a worker two years of salary to lay them off. Wow. And they couldn't afford to do that. And um, so they didn't know what to do. A workers' committee came to them, said they'd take a pay cut with three conditions. One, the profit sharing, their profit sharing percentage would go up from 25%. It would be increased until salaries could be restored. Second, management would take a 40% cut in salary. And thirdly, the workers would get the right to approve every expenditure of the company. And Semler agreed to all three conditions. And it was a tremendous success. They worked their way out of the problem. And today, the, the company is booming. Um, basically, it's a confederation of small freestanding units. The structure is part of why Semco can adapt quickly uh, to threats and seize opportunities. The units are limited to 150. This is another thing they got from Gore. Bill Gore realized early on when he got more than 150 people in one area, problems started. So he started to build the campus in his industrial area with 100 room for 150 people with 150 parking spaces. If you've read Tipping Point, has anybody heard of that book, Tipping Point? No. They have a whole section on that principle of 150. Both Gore and Semco use that. They don't allow more than 150 people to congregate in one particular area. And in that 150, people are divided into small groups of anywhere from 6 to 12. So, and experts say that the 150 is the largest group that a human being can feel a part of and create a context that positively affects social behavior. So, a couple of the principles, the underlying principles at Semco. This is from Semler, Ricardo Semler. Rather than force our people to expand a business beyond its natural limits, we encourage them to start new businesses. We give people the freedom to do what they want, and over the long haul, their successes will outnumber their failure, failures. Leaders are challenged. They cannot simply protect themselves with symbols of power like closed offices or special parking places. They have to rely exclusively on their ability to generate respect. By the way, both Semler and Gore, Bill Gore, did not have offices that were bigger than anyone else's offices or special parking places or any of that stuff. All the corner rooms in the offices, they made go into gardens so nobody would have a special corner room. Now, all these things are messages that they're sending to somebody who walks into the co company that this is different than anything they've ever experienced before, and they're going to have ultimate freedom to do what they want to succeed, as long as it works. It's got to work. So, final one, real quickly, I just have to mention it because it's so incredible, and that's D. Hawk. Um, who was chairman of the board and the founder of Visa. Uh, Bank of America in 1968 had no idea what to do with their credit card company, the Bank of America card, remember that? But MasterCard was already way ahead, 
and other competitors, American Express. And one of the people on the board knew Dee Hock and knew how, of his successes in other companies. Dee came in and he said, okay, I'll do it, but I don't want any interference whatsoever from you guys in how I do this, because it's going to be different than anything you've ever seen before. And he basically applied the same principles I've just been talking about to Visa from the very beginning. Within a few years, Visa was the largest commercial enterprise on the planet with $1.25 trillion in revenues. And observers would say, they'd come in and look at the company and what he had done, and it was a totally flat that was non-hierarchical. And the center was, as Hawk called it, a non-coercive non enabling uh, association. That's what it was. It wasn't top-down. His principles that he um, actually observed by watching nature. This is how he thought. He brought these principles in and started Visa with these principles in mind. It must not attempt to impose uniformity. It should be open to all qualified participants. Power, function, and resources should be distributed to the maximum degree. No interest should be able to dominate deliberations or control decisions, particularly management. To the maximum degree possible, everything should be voluntary and it should introduce, not compel, change. Now, if you look at all the principles that he Im implemented there, the principles that Semler impl implemented in Semco and Gore at Gore-Tex, I, I basically came up with these fundamental principles that were common to all three organizations. One, belief in freedom and non-coercion. Uh, highly developed value system based on ethical principles and the belief that individuals will blossom with the focus when you focus on a, an ethical system of non-coercion. Non-hierarchical, consisting of small self-governing units with a highly effective but flexible communication and feedback system. And this resulted in developing highly creative, happy, innovative, successful individuals working in harmony with each other. No one that was competing with three, these three companies could compete with them once they implemented these programs because they were getting the most out of their individual their people. So folks, this is a model that works. These are the fundamental principles of the model that works. We don't have to prove this model. These companies have proven it to us. All we need to do is adapt this model, these principles, to the whole society, which we can do, which actually Bob Podolsky has already done in the book called Flourish, uh, which I hope you will all buy and, 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 uh, and let's see what time. Okay, I've got a few more minutes, and then we'll take questions. I just want to give you two examples that uh, Jefferson, Adams, and Franklin um, actually had, um, they had designed the first symbol for America, and they proposed that that, it was a coin, it had two-sided coin, and on one side was a symbol that, re, that um, brought, that uh, represented the early Israelis under Moses, and the other side was the Anglo-Saxons. What did, he, what did they like about those two civilizations? Well, basically they were both based on the principle of tens, ten family unit. And the power was with the individual human being and then the family unit. And the power rose from the bottom up. Um, and, it, and it worked very well. Here's in uh, Skousen's, uh, Cleon Skousen's book, 5,000 Year Leap. He said that the, the traits that were common to both the Anglo-Saxons and Israelis were as follows. The equal representation, unalienable rights of the individual, local resolution of problems to the maximum extent possible, few laws, those that did exist were well known by the people, a justice system based on complete reparation to the person who had been wronged. In other words, no victim, no crime. Organized into small groups in which every adult had a voice and a vote. And family units of 10, each with an elected leader within units of 50 families, etc. Here's how that looked. Okay, the power is at the base of the pyramid here. Whoops, come on now. Oh, there you are. Uh, base of the pyramid. The base, this large base here represents where the power is. As it goes up the pyramid, there was less power. So the individuals were, had the most power. If they had a problem, they dealt with it within their family. If they couldn't deal with it within the family, they dealt with it within the group of 10 families. 
And that's probably where 99% of the problems were dealt with. If there were problems between somebody in one 10 family group and another 10 family group, then they went to the uh, leader of the 50 family unit and so on to the 100 family and 1,000 family group. And so there was very little to do with these top areas. They had much, the only thing that they had to worry about was defense and external relations with other nations and other states. So that was that. Now, basically, that's what we had in this country before the Revolutionary War. We had this model. The, the, the oppression of England on the colonies was not in existence until really the 1760s. That's when it started. And even then, it wasn't that bad. It was in, in the, the, with the coercive acts in 74 that it really became bad. And then they revolted. But this model was already in existence in this country. The people were extremely self-sufficient in their own communities. <coughs> How did that work? Well, look at this. This is a great, I love this one. In 1780, there was about 3 million people in the United States, in the, in the 13 colonies. By 1905, with 5% of the land area of the world and 6% of the population, the United States was producing over half of almost everything that was produced on the planet. We're talking clothes, food, houses, transportation, communications, even luxuries. And more people were moving here from other nations and other countries than er any other nation in the history of the world because of the freedom. Now, it wasn't perfect. That model wasn't perfect. But it allowed for more freedom than any other nation did at the time. So from 1780 to 1905, there was tremendous prosperity and tremendous expansion and explosion of creativity because of the freedom and because of the model that was already in existence here. Do I think we should return to the Constitution? No, nope, I don't, because it's a model that's already been, it was already corrupted before it was ever ratified by the powers that be. And Jefferson knew it. He knew it in, uh, in uh, by the way, this is the model that we have now. It's been completely, that power pyramid has been completely turned upside down. And now we have a, a government that comes in and raids our raw, our raw milk producers that we have a private contract with and lines up their children and the, the Amish farmers with machine guns and pours the milk in front of the children down the, on the ground. I mean, that's, that's what we have now. So just one example of many. Um, Jefferson in 1781, He'd already warned us about the, the central bankers. He tried to warn us um, when he was in the cabinet uh, later on with, with, uh, Jeff, with, Matt, with uh, Alexander Hamilton. Um, but he was war he, in 1798, 17, excuse me, 1789 is when the first central bank was put into place in this country. In 1781, Jefferson said, Excuse me, I'm wrong, that was 1789. But he could already see in 1781, before the Revolutionary War was already over, that the central bankers were having their influence and other elite groups were having their influence. And he said this, the spirit of the times may alter, will alter. Our rulers will become corrupt, our people careless. From the conclusion of this war, we shall be going downhill. It will not then be necessary to resort every moment to the people for support. They will be forgotten, therefore, and their rights disregarded. They will forget themselves, but in the sole faculty of making money, and will never think of uniting to effect a due respect for their rights. The shackles, therefore, will be made heavier and heavier till our rights shall revive or expire in a convulsion. I'm almost surprised he doesn't add on there, in 2008, your <laughs> banks will fail, and then your government will bail out the bankers with billions of your dollars and give them bonuses and et cetera. And your children and their children will be indebted forever to the bankers. I mean, he could have added all that. It's almost like he knew that, isn't it, yeah. when you read that quote. So are we going to unite to effect a due, uh, a due respect for our rights? I think we need to. And I think we need to, this time, create a more perfect model than we did before. And he could already see the corruption taking place in that model in 1781. This is before the, con the uh, Constitutional Convention, which when Patrick Henry heard about it, he said, I smell a rat. 
and when George Mason, who helped write the Constitution, was asked to sign it at the end of the Constitutional Convention, he said, I'd sooner cut off my right hand than sign this document. Now those are two of my heroes right there. And then Sam Adams, Richard Henry Lee, um, those guys wouldn't have any part of it because they knew that there was loopholes built in there that would lead to what we have today. So, Flourish by, Bill, by Bob Podolsky. What does it contain? What does it, the, the model that Bob has come up with contain? A bill of ethics based on non-coercion. It's a beautiful. That's, uh, to me, you, when you read that, and it's the very first part of the book where he explains the ethics, it's in the right place in the book because it's number one, is this ethics. If we can get everyone to buy in to this bill of ethics, and there's no religion that would disagree with these ethics, uh, there's no spiritual path that would disagree, it is, it is just basic, based on human laws of nature, and it's all based on non-coercion. If we can get people to buy into this bill of ethics, anything is possible. But we need more than that. We need a structure of how we work together within small units. And Bob and uh, John David Garcia have done the research over 15 to 20 years, right? Proving that eight people is the ideal number to work together in a small group. And within that group of eight people, four should be men and four should be women. And that's the absolute, they got the best results of eight people with four men and four women than of any other combination and any other number. Over 15 to 20 years of working like this. Unanimous decision making. I don't know how many people realize, but one of the things that the Continental Congress did uh, when they were debating the Declaration of Independence was they, they made it, a, it had to be a unanimous decision or there would be no declaration. And they worked and they worked, it took longer, but they did get that unanimous decision. We've done that, I've done that in groups and it does work. Um, it's, 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 it takes training, it takes patience. But it's very powerful. When you do arrive at a unanimous decision and you make the decision up front that you're going to work with unanim unanimity, it works. It's very powerful. Well, I'll just, I'll, let's take questions in just a minute. Balance of female and male energy. Structure for connecting the octologues and the whole mats. That's another part of the structure. We can accomplish anything that government does for us today with this structure. We can put any number of people together with this bill of ethics with this structure and accomplish anything that our government does for us today without force, without coercion. And then training and maximizing the effectiveness of communications, decision making, and performance of the octologues and much, much more. I highly recommend you read Bob's book. Uh, don't walk away without two or three copies. Uh, hopefully we have enough. But they're down at our booth. It's a common sense revisited booth. Okay. Um, so welcome to Titania. We call this new model, this new society, non-coercive society, Titania. It's a self-governing structure that will eventually replace all coercive organizational structures. And we get right back to Bucky Fuller. You never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, we build a new model that makes the old model obsolete. Now we can argue about how long this is going to take. I hope it doesn't take a generation. If you read the tipping point, you'll see how things work with human beings. Probably we'll reach a tipping point at some point where enough people will be operating within Titania in a non-coercive manner and all kinds of other people, big numbers, will realize this is a better model and leave the existing. And it'll just fall away. It'll literally just fall away. Yes? Uh, why, why do you call it Titania? What's the reason? Bob? It's a metaphor. I'm going to go to the back so everyone can hear me. It's just a metaphor. Uh, years ago, I had a website called Gaia Friends. May I come up front? Sure, come on up. Don't have to twist around. Yeah, please do. That some will be looking this way, some will be looking that way. All right. Uh, could you anyway. stand next to us? The mic will pick him up. Yeah. Okay. Come on. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Years ago, I, I had this website called Gaia Friends because Gaia was the Greek earth goddess, and I figured we all live on this uh, planet, <clears throat> so we might as well have some kind of metaphor for what we're about. And uh, Gaia was the goddess of the earth, 
And she had children, according to the mythology, and the children were the Titans. And I said, well, gee, hmm. They inherited the earth from their mother, and uh, who are the Titans today? Well, we, who's inherited the earth? That's us. So, oh my gosh, if we had a country that reflected that, it, it would have a name like Titan something, Titania. And uh, that means that we are now the inheritors of the earth, and it's up to us what happens to our species, and we can take control of that and change the models and improve everything. So that's the origin of Titania. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. So Bob, for those of you that don't know, um, Bob, myself, Michael Badmerick, and Foster Gamble, the four of us will be in a panel tomorrow at 4 o'clock in this room or that room. I can't remember which. And uh, we'll be, all four of us, from our different perspectives, we'll be talking about what we think of Titania in this model, and then taking questions and comments from all of you. So we hope you can join us. Uh, they have given us permission to stay longer than 5 o'clock because there's nothing competing with us after 5. And we'll stay tomorrow as long as, as you want. And uh, the reason the four of us are, are going to be in on this is we all, from our unique perspectives, have aspects of this which, which we're very, very excited about. And it kind of syncs with some of the things that we've, we've done in the past as well, very much with Thrive. In fact, Bob, the name of Bob's book, Flourish, was Thrive until Foster came out and made the name Thrive famous with his organization. So Bob had to go back to the drawing boards on naming his book. <laughs> Did you know that? Yeah, yeah. So yes, question. Have you had any thoughts about what happens to that 20% that of the population that just needs this authoritarian structure to... You know, I think that, I think that there will be, there, there's going to be a transition here, obviously. Yeah. You know, and it's going to take some time, and we don't know exactly how it works. Freedom's messy, folks. I mean, if you want to read a great book about this, read D. Hock's book, The Birth of the Chaotic Age. Chaord was his word that he termed that's a combination of chaos, or freedom, and order. He wanted to have an organization that had just enough order to keep it going. So it would be a stable, you know, ongoing organization and as much freedom as possible. And that's how he built Visa. But it took him a while. And as soon as he started to retire and these other guys came in, two years later it was gone. I mean, just gone. They just destroyed it. Because the, the, that's, it's just so... It's so foreign to people who come out with their MBAs and, and stuff like that. Yep. So, so anyway, the, the, the 20%. So I think what will happen is at some point, when this model really takes over, there won't be any of those force-based institutions left. And they'll find their way into understanding and being able to appreciate this. It's going to be, let, let's put it this way. This transition is going to be very easy for some people. And it's going to be less easy for others, and it's going to be difficult for others. But at some point, even the, for those it's difficult for, there's not going to be anything left of that. Because there'll be so many people that are refusing to be coerced. They're just not going to be coerced anymore. But I'm also wondering what makes these people successful right now. Isn't there also a percentage of the population that wants to be structured? Well, look how many applicants Gore had last year. 38,000 people wanted to work for that company. I mean, any human being, and let me put it this way, almost every human being wants to be able to be in an environment where they can be successful and use their full potential. There are very few people that don't want to do that. But there are some. But you know what? Those people are going to wake up too. I think that flame for freedom is in every person's heart. It might be turned on really, really low. You know, but even though, even if it's out, you could probably stick a match in there and get it going again. <laughs> uh, did, you had a question. Well, there was, uh, I, you were talking about at the Declaration of Independence, they wanted to make it, it had to be unanimous. Yes. Well, I, I also remember, at least maybe it was a fable or something, but there was an instance where they took <coughs> out that they 
uh, by con unanimous consent of the governed was the phrase, and they took that part out of the Declaration of Independence. I don't know if that's a fairy tale or not. I don't know, but the Declaration of Independence is a pretty darn good document, and it does, it does um, reflect this concept of indigenous and surrogate power. It says very clearly in there that the, all the power in this institution <coughs> that we're creating, this surrogate that we're creating, rests with the people, and then if at any point in the future the people don't like the way it's going, they have the right and the duty to alter or abolish it. That's pretty clear language on who's in control. Um, there's no the uh, people. There are individuals. Individual and an individual. Each person is an individual. Absolutely. Uh, uh, the, the question that I comes to mind is. Uh, and, and thank you for reminding me. I shouldn't use that term. I should use the individuals. Yeah. You know, and the reason I became a teacher of TM, I love this analogy. The introductory lecture, and it's, I, I'll never forget it. I remember, whoa. He said, to make a forest green, each individual tree has to be green. Oh, yeah, that really makes sense. It's simple. So I'm going to become a TM teacher and teach every individual in the world to meditate. That was the way I thought. But anyway, that's, that's, you're right. It's every individual. Now, as far as this whole concept of, well, you know, yeah. it works best to have eight people and yeah. have an equal share of the right. and and so on. I, realistically, in uh, a free society, a organization can structure itself or the individuals within the within any group of individuals can choose whatever methods of association that they wish. Absolutely. They will all compete with each other for I don't know, other you know, other people to be interested in buying what they're what they're selling, right. or whatever it may be. Uh, Correct. and we don't necessarily have to pick a model and go with that one and, you know You don't have to do anything. But, but I think what will happen well, is, we'll yeah, I think you're exactly right. Better. And this model may not be that one. Right. It seems to me like it very well could be, but it's going to be, the test will be performance. Does it perform? And if it does, then people are going to go, you know what, I'm going to go out and look for four women and three other guys, or, you know, three other women and four other guys, depending on whether you're a man or a woman, and I'm going to create an octolog. And that's what they're going to do because they've seen octologues of four men and four women work really, really well. Maybe those four, maybe they knew somebody that created an octolog like that. And the only purpose of that octolog was to increase the wealth of each member of that octolog. Like a mastermind group, like a Napoleon Hill mastermind group. I used to have one of those. It was just four guys. Wow, so powerful. We all got a lot, healthy, a lot wealthier very quickly when we did that. It's a very powerful concept. So that's your, your the, the proof will be in the performance. In yeah, in, yeah, in competition with other models. Yeah. I just wanted to add that this model is not a proposal for the end result. It's a starting point, and it's going to evolve. It's going to change. Bob even says that in his book. He said either this or its ethical equivalent, right? Did I get that right? Yeah. So. Um, will work. It doesn't have to be this. But something that is this or its ethical equivalent will succeed eventually. Did you have a question? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, have, have you and, and your friends looked at uh, software development models at, for ideas of how free association kinds of uh, organizations can take place? When you look at open source, there's a lot of situations where you have voluntaristic, non-hierarchical development yes. systems where they, they invent some of the most amazing solutions to our problems. Like one great example that a lot of people here including myself, are all about is Bitcoin. It's completely community-based. Right. There's no higher, There's no one in charge. There is a Bitcoin foundation yep. that kind of gives it a face to industry for the purpose of standardization, but it has no authority whatsoever. And if people don't agree with it or don't even agree with the core developers, they can take the source code and change it and, you know, and tweak it just, you know, and there's, there's plenty of altcoins which are based on the Bitcoin model that have something about a change like the inflation rate or different things like that. So yeah, I mean, what about looking for ideas? Oh, fantastic. Help, help. go to Bob. Yeah. You guys create an octolog on open source. <laughs> okay, I'm serious. And help bring that to all the other octologs, you know? Yeah. That'd be great. I mean, I think it's wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Um, do we have to get out of here? We still have a couple more minutes, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, go ahead. You know, it, 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 you're exactly right. It, and, and, the, and, and you're right too. And I'm just dovetailing on what you're saying. And because I've been with Bob for about six years now, and Bitcoin and Titania fit together like yeah. like perfect. It's decentralized organization <clears throat> combined with a decentralized money supply. And just to give you an idea how this process works is about, I think it was about a month ago, I heard that Foster was gonna be here and I knew that Bob and Foster had been communicating and I said, bam, we gotta go to Liver Topia, I don't care how the hell I'm gonna get there, my butt's gonna be in the car, we're gonna be here. I don't give a shit, this is how it's gonna happen. Anyway, I call up Clyde and say, hey man, guess what? We're going to Liver Topia, you gonna go? And he goes, you know what? I wasn't planning on doing it, I think I'm gonna do it. Change some stuff around and this took like two days. Yeah, it was only a few days ago. Yeah, yeah, it was like crazy. Not very long. Yeah. Then what happened? Okay, he knows Mike Badnark. Mike, what you, I think you need to be here. Mike's getting on board. And it's like, <laughs> boom, boom, boom. Then I talked to Keith. I said, hey, man, you got to be here, man. This is going to be unfreaking believable. In a day, he turned his, I'm not going to go. I don't know if I can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, and then I, I can call him. Hey, I'm, on, I'm, in, the, I'm in Ernie's car going to Libertopia. I'm almost there. And then the same thing happened yeah. with uh, Mike Basic. Yeah. He was like, no. I'm well, then the incredible thing is we all get here and we turn around and there's Bernard Renato. I know. Woo! It's just proof. <laughs> it's right there already. Right. <laughs> Thank you. Very good idea. Sorry. That's it, my old top down. When I met Bill Gore, by the way, I had it in my card. Guess what my card said? Chairman of the board, CEO, CEO and co-founder of United Investment Groups. Do you see why Susan Gore had such a hard time with me? I got to tell you the quick story, OK? So, um, so, so for Susan Gore and I had a, quite an interesting relationship. She, she really liked me, but she also would get very frustrated with me. And at one point, when we were having trouble because the tax law changed and we couldn't do our $20 million offering. By the way, with that $20 million offering, I was 34. My net worth would have gone from $2 million to $4 million as soon as we got the offering sent out to all of our financial planners around the country. We had the offering memorandum printed up. It was going out. It was like January 30th, 1986. We're ready to send it out. That's how close I was to having my net worth double. And I got a call from my accountant. He said, Clyde, um, Rostenkowski's people, remember the criminal from Chicago? And Reagan's people got together last night, and they changed the entire tax law, and they eliminated all the R&D write-offs, all the R&D tax credits, and most of the limited partnership advantages for tax, tax advantages. And in other words, the, the 10,000 offering memorandums you have ready to go out are not worth the paper they were written on. The wallpaper. Within a year, I had to declare bankruptcy. So anyway, I didn't listen to Susan Gore. But anyway, she was in my office one day, and she said, OK, so I want to go over these finances with you. And I said, well, I can't do that, Susan, today, because my CFO isn't in today. And she looked at me, and she said, you should know those numbers. And she'd been telling me this. This was one of my weaknesses. And I said, I started to make excuses, and she just got really frustrated, and she goes, you're the purest marketing animal I've ever seen. And she wasn't happy with me. And I went, well, thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate it. Because to me, that was a big compliment. <laughs> but anyway, so my company's name now is Pure Mark, Pure Marketing Animal from that day. All right, thank you very much for coming. Don't forget tomorrow, 4 o'clock. Thank you.